And uh, by the time I had called in, told the kids to keep walking and gotten to those cones that, you know, keep us from driving into the open space, the sheriff was already out there knocking on doors, telling people, well, I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. Cause the kids are screaming at the top of their lungs. They're like, time to evacuate. So I'm like, it's okay. But you guys did a great job at really quickly, um, handling the situation and coming down the street with the sheriff vehicle and stuff, letting us all know it was, uh, very much appreciated. And, um, thank you for my first fire. I've got a lot of firsts apparently in this, in this last two years, my first pandemic, my first fire and evacuation, but, uh, Thank you, and um, we look forward to continuing to harden our spaces with you guys. Thank you. I think the only question I have is, we got those, I like those NOAA radios or whatever, mm -hmm. and I know mine broke, so I, I know why mine <laughs> didn't work. Like it's, I, yeah. So I don't know, I know we were working, and I think it was Chief White that was working with you, Eric, but I could be totally wrong that's just when I started up on the, on the commission here, but um, those were, should those have gone off if mine worked? Mine's unplugged. Those radios were actually through a, a pilot program funded by Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority and Fire Safe Marin. Um, I've heard from a few people who have them that nothing went off. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll bring that up to powers that be some we've been kind of discussing a little bit more at a commission level, but we'll certainly see if uh, this was the type of incident when they should have gone off. And if it wasn't that type of incident, then what exactly type of incident is it that does make them uh, sound, sound the alert? So yes, no, Chris, you're not the first okay. person who said that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Mine went off when there was high winds, but didn't go off for this. So I, and I don't, I don't unfortunately know the answer to that off the top of my head. I, that may be a separate alerting that has to be engaged, but uh, just today I actually had a, a conversation with the superintendent from the school district and just reiterating, you know, how challenging cell service is out in that area. And so it's certainly something to consider, uh, you know, that, that a lot of folks may not really have great communications out there and that, that weather radio might be the right thing for, yeah. for that type of thing. Yes. I got my um, notifications from Nextel the following day. Oh. <laughs> but so were did you, you pack up and leave? leave? <laughs> well, my neighbor <laughs> called us when we were out of town <laughs> saying that we were being evacuated. So I uh, make you stress but, even more. Bill, before you go on any public comment, too, I also want to point out uh, Deputy Chief uh, Bob Sinnott. Um, actually came here while the incident was happening and uh, stayed here right in front of the firehouse and the community center uh, and was really good at, a, you know, a few members of the public coming up and asking questions and looking for uh, information. And he was just an incredible resource to have available to us to be able to do that and be right here. I mean, he couldn't stay for long and he eventually moved more over towards the incident itself. But um, the fact that he thought enough to come over here and, and, and stay here, even though we had other engines constantly swapping in uh, for coverage in case there was other calls or medical calls, uh, having Chief Senate here was just uh, so uh, Chief Windrum, uh, I've told this to Chief Senate already, but please reiterate that we were very appreciative of his time and recognizing that, okay, public's going to have questions and uh, the answers just sound a lot better from somebody wearing a uniform and a badge. So uh, it was, uh, and not to mention, I mean, it, He's about the most perfect person to uh, play that role at that point in time because yeah. he's just, he's very calm. He's very reassuring. He's very uh, congenial and, and warm and welcoming. So again, um, please express my gratitude and uh, on behalf of everybody who talked to him, I know a lot of people are very appreciative of having him there. Awesome. Will do. Will do. I, and I was one of them, <laughs> but I want to just tell you, Eric, I trusted you too. I trusted uh. your response as well. <laughs> So yeah, and I I want to reiterate. I mean, I was I was incredibly impressed by the quick response and how this fire was was handled. I mean, it was also my first fire in this area, um, and it kind of it brought to mind just a couple of, of questions. One of them I'll, I'll bring up now. One of them I might bring up later. Um, it, I noticed that when 
the evacuation orders came out, um, everything that I, I read indicated that there wasn't, there wasn't anywhere for anyone to go who was, to, who was being evacuated. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering, and I don't know if this is the right place to ask the question. I mean, do we have some sort of a, a plan in place or are we maybe drawing something up that maybe can, can ha have some sort of plan um, if we find ourselves in this situation again where people are needing to evacuate, having some place to go? Yeah, so after all of these types of incidents, we, we all, almost always do some sort of an after action review. And even the next day, um, folks that were involved with the evacuations and the alerting aspect were, were having that discussion. And that was an area that was identified as um, a, a, an area to improve in that, hey, we need to, we need to direct folks to some, you know, uh, uh, they have a, uh, a whole lot of terminology and acronyms, but I think it's a, t a TEP, a temporary evacuation point, just essentially kind of, you know, go to the east side of the highway and hang out at the cinema or something, you know, that some, something along those lines to provide that information. So I think that, that was missing in the early alerting, um, but as recognized as an error that um, folks are taking as a lesson learned for future um, needs like that. Um, interestingly, we were we were hampered at the incident command post as well with the, just the cell difficulties. You know, it's such a such a different ball game when you you know it's hard to make a phone call and just have a two minute conversation. So, um, but that was an area that was definitely identified. So thanks and thanks for bringing it up. And to follow Chief, up, it, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say to follow up on what Lisa said, um, we helped our neighbor who is in her 80s and had family who evacuated from Tahoe and showed up <laughs> to then get evacuated from here. They went to the Civic Center and she's been here since this area has been built. And she's like, oh, you just go to the Civic Center. You always go to the Civic Center. So apparently in the past, when things have gone down in the neighborhood, they used to go to the Civic Center. So if we're going to go with what the older people do not all of them not all of them. a lot of us just went to bed well some people went to north gate <laughs> to go eat ice cream and have coffee and other people went into the city so it people went everywhere but the older people who are not going to be as mobile and those are the people that i think that we're most concerned about are um are people with kids right is they went to the civic center so if that helps you with what you're planning if this is like people's jerk reaction is to go to the civic center. Maybe that's a good idea to do it at the civic center. I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely my, my non-expert. Non yeah, that's, that's one of the areas that's often used and we've utilized it over the last few years, a couple of times as an evacuation center, primarily taking people yes. in from outside the county, but um, it's de it definitely has a lot of those things that you'd be looking for when it comes to um, the, the infrastructure to support something like that. Chief, if I could also follow up on this, um, you know, in the middle of this, I was, you know, back and forth several times with uh, Quinn Gardner, who's the Santa Fe Emergency Services Manager, as well as other people from the Marin uh, OES office, and uh, they were able to coordinate um, the YMCA did open up their facility as a temporary uh, staging and evacuation center. Um, by the time they got that, I mean, this was pretty short lived, the actual evacuation order was pretty quick. Um, and we were certainly looking at that. They did put it out. I believe it went out on one of the, uh, either the Alert Marin or Nixel or both. Um, but literally within 20 minutes after that information going out, the order wound up being lifted uh, and downgraded to a evacuation warning. So they, there was certainly people working in that moment, coordinating. A lot of times our facility becomes this, but we were in the evacuation zone. Uh, and Eric, we lost your audio there. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, they were moving through with the YMCA, and by the time they were able to get uh, coordinated with the YMCA, which literally was not long after this incident started, it was also very quickly then after uh, the evacuation order was downgraded to an evacuation warning. So there was certainly a lot of work happening while the incident was taking place to coordinate a, a level of... Uh, of uh, an evac evacuation place for people to go and stage while they waited. Mm -hmm. 
Fortunately, it wasn't needed. I think a lot of people wound up going to the parking lot at Northgate Mall and waiting there. <laughs> I heard a lot of people had a lot of ice cream and drank a lot of coffee. Coffee. Um, Lisa, I don't want to cut you off. Did you have any other questions? No, no, no. Thank you. That, 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 was, that was it for me. Okay, I have just one question is, as a board member, what is our role? I understand that the first is safety and to get out, but is there any other requirement that we need to do? I, you know, I think, I think probably the biggest thing is, um, you know, based on, and this is not official, this is probably not in the California code of board regulations or wherever you find those sorts of things <laughs> um but would be would be just to just to having gone through this um you know you're now you now can help those neighbors and those folks in the community who may be identified that they never got the alert marin warning because they although we've tried to um, advertise so many different ways what what to do um and how to sign up for that they they never gotten signed up, or um, you know that that they're not in they're not ready to um, they they haven't gotten those alerts etc. You know after the San Rafael Hill fire we dealt with that you know folks saying you know I realized I just don't know how to get alerts I never got anything I'm I I must not be signed up so you know there's sign up for Nixle via eight 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 seven 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 and text your zip code um, there's you know alertmarin.org to actually get signed up and then you know, talking with neighbors about the, those, the older folks who might need help, you know, do you know who amongst your neighbors needs help? And, and that's just for any, any citizen living in our communities, but particularly for you folks as leaders in the community and involved in the emergency services. That's what I would kind of say is, is, the, is probably the best, the highest and best use of your time and energy after something like this is making sure that, you know, nobody's going to slip through the cracks if we have to do this again. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Can we <clears throat> open it up to the public? Yeah. One second, please. Steven.
Thank you, Stephen. Anybody else, Eric? Okay. I guess uh, that concludes uh, Chief Windrum. I really appreciate your coming in tonight. Thank and you very much. Thanks we for may having see me. you next month too, I guess. I don't know. I, I anticipate the Chief White will be back. <laughs> okay. We'll see. That's true. That's true. Thank you. All right, thank Matt, you. Matt, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Thank you. Uh, the date of the next fire commission meeting is October 5th. Great. On to the draft minutes of the Park and Recreation Commission meeting. Review. Any questions, comments? Um, my, sorry, I'm trying to get to the right page here. My, where did it go? Um, it says, um, talking about the uh, item five, the park play structure replacement project. They discussed the project, the grant funding, and everything. It's I, I I just feel like I don't know, and maybe this is just me, but I I don't know that I'm really feeling as much in the loop as I should be on a project that's like kind of a centerpiece of the neighborhood. Um, and I don't I don't know like I don't know if it was just discussed for a couple minutes or if there were some like larger points made. I don't know. Lisa, do you want it or me? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this wasn't discussed too much in this meeting. It was just more kind of an update. I'm trying to remember if uh, this was the board that approved this project. If you look in the PNR packet, uh, it also discusses the timing. This whole project uh, completion date is still a year and a half out. Oh, totally. um, it's a grant funded program. The application, uh, uh, for it is due in December, and that's just basically stating our intent to replace the playground component. Um, we're right now finalizing. There will be some public outreach that'll go out about it, um, you know, kind of in the form of surveys, uh, as well as uh, a big up part of this update was talking about what the uh, the bidding process is going to look like for this, because it will be a public works job, mm -hmm. uh, and that how something like this will be uh, a design and build. Um, because a lot of the playground equipment and things vary by manufacturer and by vendor. And this allows vendors a chance to kind of make proposals in terms of overall design and we can work with them and instead of uh, we want to be limited to coming back to them. So when we get to that point, um, obviously, uh, before any contracts or agreements are approved, that would certainly come back to the board. So it's something that the Park and Rec Commission is working on right now. They've uh, Kind of put together and finalized the survey. Luke and I, uh, uh, with a lot of Carolyn's help, we're going to put that out to the community, and, uh, probably like via Survey Monkey. And we talked about best way to get that information out there. Um, it'll be mostly qualitative in nature, so that we can get some feedback to help kind of guide the scope and look of this. Uh, the primary purpose of this is uh, the equipment that we have, uh, especially in our main playground, has reached. Uh, uh, you know, not only the end of its useful life, but certainly the end of its replacement life. Sure. Um, and we're having a very difficult time and Luke can probably speak much greater to this <laughs> than I can just in being able to locate qualified replacement parts for it. When parts break, um, they've gotten very expensive um, and you can't just go in and kind of rebuild it yourself. I mean, Luke could speak more to that as a uh, certified playground inspector. But it's a little, uh, it's a little, you can't just go in and, uh, you know, throw a couple two by fours and something and call it fixed. Yeah, no, I, I understand all that. I, cause Luke, you've discussed that before. And I totally appreciate the fact that we need to, that, that the parks and rec commission is looking at something that's where, you know, we're replacing it. I just didn't, based on these notes, I didn't, I didn't know how deep they had gotten into it. Um, uh, I was recently doing a little bit of research and found out that Cal actually has, one of the top landscape design schools in the country. And I kind of saw this as maybe a creative way of, of trying to get some graduate students to maybe 
give us some free work. Well, to be clear, within the scope, this is a capital uh, a capital project. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you know, it's not landscape or things like that. This is actually, uh, uh, you know, like uh, I just uh, the, uh, the exact term is escaping me. But this is capital. This is replacement. This isn't repair. Um, you know, so it's what qualifies under the funding for this. So right, right now we're looking at this as just the replacement of the actual playground equipment itself. So we're kind of looking at how uh, within the space given, um, right now the scope doesn't involve re-landscaping the playground area um, greatly at any rate. It's just how can we maximize the space and what is some of the best, uh, you know, kind of interactive equipment that can be placed there. Right, right. No, that, and that's what, that falls under the scope of, of what I was talking about is, is I know we're not going to like re-landscape the entire park area there and right. stuff like that. Um, but just in doing this, all, it's all part of college research. You'll be there soon, Eric. Yeah. Um, and I just happen to it, like just for the fact that we've got a school right next to us that maybe could be, uh, I mean, it's obviously a total long shot, but I didn't know how creative we, the park and rec commission was looking to get on it. Right. Yeah, no, it's uh, we're right now. We're just living within the funds and the scope of what the grant allows. Okay. Um, which is again, you know, kind of capital replacement, cap, uh, capital, uh, you know, capital needs, um, you know, facilities, equipment, uh, things along those lines. But it's not, they're very clear in that, you know, this isn't like to repair or do anything like that. This is, you know, new structures, new, uh, right. new items or replace, you know, full replacement of items, um, which is uh, where the playground falls under. Right. Okay. And the place structure, I guess, is right. the proper term. Right. So we're looking at replacing those structures that currently exist in the park. Cool. Uh, I have a question regarding the Blackstone Canyon and Horn Trail. I'm just out of curiosity, what came out of that discussion and how often do we maintain that trail because it is a basic single track <laughs> trail uh, i'll let luke go with that yeah so our discussion um at the commission meeting i gave a short um, like powerpoint just on the basics of uh, a little bit of the history of our maintenance uh, routine on that trail what our staff uh, attends to what what things are sort of beyond our scope and um sort of the issues that we that we deal with and uh from you know fallen trees that we go out and have to to clear out of the way um to just some of the challenges of, of all the extra traffic on the trail with with bikes and, and new access from the the new Pawnee ridge trail so we had a lot of discussion about that and um uh commissioner john campo um offered a lot of um insight on on the trail maintenance uh, from his uh point of view at the county and just discussion of um you know, kinds of things need to go into keeping a trail maintained um, in the long term. And um, so it was just sort of a general discussion about um, about that. And uh, as far as like, there wasn't like a big uh, major conclusion or takeaway, just um, sort of getting everyone more informed on on what it is that we do out there and uh, where our, our limitations are. And it comes down to, you know, we, we wish we had more um, staff we could dedicate to uh, to the trail and, and more resources that we could put into that. But in the, um, in the meantime, the trail is in, is in good shape and um, it's, it's very widely used and uh, we do, you know, we do the best we can out there. Um, so I don't know, Eric, I think that's a fair characterization. Okay, no, you're, you're muted. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. It was, you know, just also just kind of talking a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of some of the increased usage that it's seen lately and things along those lines. And there are some questions that came up around uh, it being a, a hiking only trail versus a multipurpose that allows for biking and things like that. Too. So it was. Well, once you get to a certain point in that trail along the creek, there, biking is almost damn near impossible. You mean coming down or going up? Uh, well, going up for sure. Uh, there's a couple of portages where you definitely have to get off your bike and pick it over a, a, a couple of uh, trees anyway. Well, that's good because that, it is a hiking only trail. So that's, yeah. uh, so that's all by uh, design. Uh, but I noticed, I know during the 
rainy season as it, it would be determined that trail you're going to get wet no matter what people are going to fall if you utilize that trail um, and once you get up on top because i've been up on halfway in between there's been there was a slide at one point that where the trail goes up to queen meets at queen's Stone. So about halfway up, there was a slide that wiped out part of that trail. So, I mean, it's been like that for years. So, what, what's really not not like the twenty minute version, but like the thirty second version? What is our control over something like an open space trail like that, and how far up do we go before it becomes somebody else's issue? Well. Um, Oh, sorry. I don't know if you're who you're asking. I, I, anybody who can answer it. No, because I know Tom and the Boy Scouts finished that trail right. Right. at one point. Because at one point they had markers out and it yeah, yeah. Just, they totally disappeared during a storm. I, remember but I guess my there. question is, and this speaks to, I think, something else that's on our agenda about the, the residential facility that's being built out by the, <laughs> the highway and everything like that is, what as we go into the open space what is marinwood park and rec responsible for versus then it passes off to the county and i heard the chief tonight say that even at one point it passes off to the state in terms of fire protection there is certain property that marinwood owns as a district that was either deeded to us through various portions of development or uh, purchased via bonds. Most of this occurred in the late 60s and early 70s with some of it trickling in a little bit later. Any property that is ours is our responsibility. That okay. said, we do have some uh, access and encroachment agreements like say the new Ponte Trail that was built and is maintained by the County Open Space District um, but was actually placed, a large portion of it runs through property owned by Marinwood. It also runs through some other property as well as their property. Mm -hmm. um, the chief was referring to where that other one started. I mean, I can show you maps. It's very hard for me to kind of explain it here. That's fine. I, I'm just trying to get a general idea, Eric. Yeah, yeah. basically where Idleberry meets the county facilities. Yep. Yep. All open space immediately north of that kind of resident mm -hmm. line right there mm -hmm. um, that carries through, uh, you know, down to Blackstone Canyon. Mm -hmm. um, that whole portion is ours. But then when you get past kind of Blackstone Lane and Blackstone Canyon, there's large right. chunks of open space there that are owned by um, the local Regency Homeowners Association. There's 30 or 40 acres that are owned by uh, the Catholic Charities and the Carmelite mm -hmm. Monastery. Mm -hmm. um, then you go into So it gets pretty confusing as you get okay. out there. We have about 800 acres. Okay. And unfortunately, there's not uh, open space uh, city limit signs out there. <laughs> um, and so yeah, they don't call us. This doesn't belong to us. Area. Exactly. So, so in essence, for that property that we own, we could, through recreational purposes, do whatever we want with it. Um, to a degree, sure. In okay. theory, we could. Uh, we, we, <laughs> that said, and we're going to get into this. In with a later what time. money, Chris? No, I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> what do we, you want to do? Yeah, our, we, we have very limited resources on that. Yeah, no, limited, I get that. Limited staff, uh, limited finance, uh, all of it. Uh, without a doubt. So that yeah. certainly limits what we can do. I, the open space when it was purchased or deeded over uh, was done with the intention of preserving it as open space um, right. and basically preventing further development. Uh, cool. it, wasn't, it wasn't done at that time for purposes necessarily of recreation is my understanding. And there certainly wasn't the hindsight of, um, you know, open space takes maintenance as well. And you sure. don't just get to let it sit there and do nothing with it, uh, except stop people from ever being able to build on it. So it's uh, an agency like ours. I mean, it's our open space now, and I promise you, nobody else is going to take it. So uh, <laughs> as much uh, as much as I've tried, because uh, there's other agencies much better resourced and equipped to be able to properly manage the open space in ways that we just don't have the resources. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. Learning yep. things every day. 
And yeah. Chris, don't suggest a board work day. Oh, I got all kinds of things. You got that new big truck. True. A haul, not work. Uh, anything else? Anything from the public? Yeah, one second, please. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, if anybody has anything else, we can move on to number two, potential trail along Miller Creek from Las Galinas to Marin Wood Drive. Uh, yeah, I try to, uh, you know, I have a brief staff memo in here and I'm gonna just try to speak to this a little bit more. And um, as I put in the memo, you know, back in 2000 and six during you know some of the initial planning approvals for the senior center that is going to be located uh, kind of just west of highway 101 along an extension of marinwood road that is to be built kind of past the market and the bus area uh, one of the conditions of uh, approval from a planning standpoint was the uh, creation and development of a uh, trail that would extend from las galinas avenue um, just south of Miller Creek and run along the creek down through the uh, open space area there and eventually end on what is going to be this new kind of Marinwood Drive extension leading to the uh, to be built senior facility. Um, 
this has always, you know, kind of been in our radar, but it's also always been contingent upon that senior facility actually being built now that they are continuing to move further with the senior facility. I've actually had a couple of different meetings uh, with the developer and some of his representatives and then Luke and I, um, and then a representative from the senior facility, as well as John Campos and our PNR commission actually walked the kind of proposed route. Um, I think all of us realized very quickly that uh, this was a very challenging area. Um, it is very dense. It's very steep uh, along the hillside in a lot of places. Um, the Creek Bank is eroding quite a bit right there. We all kind of question the practicality and feasibility of being able to put it up. Uh, nobody questioned that it would be a wonderful place to have a trail because it would be really nice to be able to, in essence, create an extension of our own little panhandle path that already runs on the other side of the creek. Um, but it became very challenging, uh, you know, just as, as we were walking through there and looking, and it was nice to have John's expertise as somebody who has, you know, kind of been behind some major trail builds to kind of put some things into perspective. Uh, one of the things, and it parlays perfectly off the conversation that we just had, is if any sort of a trail is to go into this area, it needs to be a, a professionally designed, um, well-built trail that is not going to just lead to massive future maintenance headaches. Um, and Luke, please, you know, feel free to chime in. Um, I'm not a trained eye. I had a trained eye out there. I don't know how incredibly possible that is. Um, I do know it would be incredibly time-consuming. It would involve many, many environmental regulatory agencies from, you know, Fish and Wildlife to Regional Water Quality Control Board to the Army Corps of Engineers, because you'd really be needing to bring in and shore up parts of the creek bank. Anytime you start touching creek bank, every one of those agencies are going to get involved. You're also going to have some outreach, um, you know, with some of the local advocacy groups. Um, you need to do some biological studies that are going to need to go through there first to, uh, identify any potential uh, impacts that may need to be mitigated if they could be mitigated. Um, as you know, much as I think we were all looking forward to, hey, this would be a great place to put a trail. I think we left our walkthrough kind of scratching our heads and wondering exactly how practical it would be to put a trail there in that area. I don't know, Luke, do you have any other kind of recap from that? No, I think you characterized that well. I mean, it was a, it was a fun, uh, if slightly treacherous hike. Um, <laughs> I, and it definitely was a, um, I mean, it would be a wonderful spot to have a trail. Uh, but yeah, the um, definitely seems like a very, very uh, large project and a very challenging project to uh, complete. And, um, and, and I think even under the best circumstances, uh, it would add a large maintenance um, factor to our, uh, our our parks maintenance schedule. Um, and under less than ideal circumstances, I think it would be, um, uh, I would be very wary of, of taking on um, a responsibility that big, you know, with, with our current situation. Um, so I think that I share your conclusions for sure. Yeah. It, so uh, with that said, you know, we kind of met and, you know, one of the things that we had talked about was potentially, uh, and John Campbell was able to give us, uh, you know, a couple of references, one of whom I've actually heard back from and is unfortunately not available to do any work like this to the spring um, just because he tore some hamstring ligaments. So I can't do any of this kind of work, but he is going to provide me some references. Uh, you know, one of the things we talked about is, is it even possible to get kind of an initial feasibility study from, you know, kind of an independent uh, third party, uh, you know, trail designer uh, before even getting into trail design, just so somebody can look at this area and say, you know, what, what are the, uh, the obvious challenges, the obvious impacts, and what would even be the potential cost, the timing? Um, is it feasible? Is it practical? Um, I don't know that, that such a study really fully exists like that. Um, the one person I contacted seemed to think that he could do something like that, but unfortunately it's just simply not available. I mean, no building at this time of year, nothing, no construction or anything is gonna be able to happen until spring anyway, because we that window closes basically on September 1st uh, in terms of that. Um, not to mention the process of going through, you know, basically another JARPA application presenting to, uh, these local groups um, having a firm trail design. Uh, in recognition of these, I did hear from the developer 
um, who basically has made a good faith offer and said, look, I recognize these challenges, uh, but, you know, also recognizes uh, that this is a condition and, and you know, it has made an offer for a one time payment to the district of 35,000 to help maintain other open space areas uh, in lieu of building this trail. Um, so that is certainly on the table at this point in time. What I'm kind of looking for from the board is, you know, any questions you may have on this and then, you know, to kind of provide some staff direction on this to either, you know, solicit a preliminary feasibility study, uh, if we could, uh, something like that, I think probably falls somewhat out of the scope of the responsibilities, just in terms of this initial feasibility study. I think any sort of trail design would most likely fall under the developer. Um, but, uh, or just to simply accept a one-time payment offer from the developer in lieu of this trail. Um, again, I, I, I reiterate that, uh, you know, I think Luke picked a, a proper word. I mean, it was treacherous. We were, you know, crawling under and over and around things while we were through there. It's incredibly overgrown area. I think, you know, 16 years ago, 15 years ago, when they had this, they kind of just envisioned a simple trail that kind of, uh, you know, a volunteer crew could come through and, uh, and mark out and do. Um, I'll tell you right now, there's that that's not a possibility. Uh, not in this area. This would need to be a professionally designed, professionally built um, trail that's going to have to jump through a lot of hoops to do it. Uh, I don't want to downplay that it would be a nice area to have a trail. Um, I just don't know that it's feasible. And I certainly um, could not put the, recommend putting the district in a situation that says, let's build this trail that we're going to recognize is going to have drainage problems. It's going to have erosion problems. Um, you're talking about, like I said, a lot of work that would go um, a lot of money, a lot of time, and then a lot of forward maintenance afterward that would go into it. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily have a recommendation at this point, which is kind of why I put this as a discuss and direct. Um, but I, I saw more, I, I saw a lot of challenges for an agency such as ours to be taking on. My question would be that based on the information that you and Luke have provided us, um, that sounds like one, that building the trail is a condition of the construction of the project. Should we accept it? Yes. Well, if we accept it, but this is in the contract of the developer in order to build his project he has to put in this trail um it's part of the it's part of the planning approval that said it would run through our property and we certainly have the right to say look we've discussed this we've looked at this and we've decided to forego doing this trail at which point that would remove it from his planning approval requirement Okay, if we if we sorry, accepted it though, no, I'm sorry, Chris. If we accepted that though, he would be under contract to build it, and it sounds like it would be an extremely expensive project to build just the trail. So when I was looking at that thirty-five thousand being like a, <coughs> that's kind of a cough. He's getting off the hook as far as I'm concerned. So um, I, I, <laughs> I was leery of this whole thing. Yeah, well, I, I, I understand where you're coming from on that, Bill. I should also point out that, um, and it's funny because the way we've been talking about open space here, the, the, <laughs> they also deeded the district a, a large piece of open space that exists between that entire hillside there was privately held by the Daphne Trust. When they split off and became Lot 1, which is now where they're building the residential facility uh, right. development, and then Lot 2, which is proposed, they also deeded the district uh, remaining open space that fell in between. And this is when the district was still in the mindset of let's acquire open space and preserve it as open space. So the district certainly got a large piece of property out of this and i just think that the vision and the intention of what that trail would or could be at that time is entirely different than what that trail needs to be 
um, and the way that we kind of looked at what trails were was you know going out there were some hand crews making a trail three to four feet wide uh tamping down some earth and calling it a day maybe throwing a retaining uh not a retaining wall but a split rail fence or something as it gets closer to the creek bank at some points um that area i i can tell you right now i'm very happy that we didn't do that 15 years ago because that trail would become a constant maintenance challenge for us especially if it was done in such a way well uh, yeah but so the land that they deeded that's part of the hill correct yeah that whole hillside there um the all kind the of way between, up to the top yep and okay. all the way back so, down to the I mean, other it's, side it's not even build the blend so that was just the case you know they they just got rid of it and gave it to us uh, well I, I i think we asked for it <laughs> to be quite honest with you um yeah i don't 10 know years I, ago we asked yeah I'm, all i'm thinking is that 35 grand seems to be a little light okay to walk can... away from their yeah. ability to build this thing um, I, I can shed a little light on this because unless I'm mistaken, I was on PNR when we accepted this piece of property. Great. Um, and it was definitely the Daphne family knew that they were never going to be able to build on that entire piece of property. And so, uh, as you were saying, the trade off is they get to build that small piece um, on, I think, what you refer to as lot one. Um, but I know that those of us who were involved in that conversation envisioned something along the lines of what we have going from Miller Creek out to Las Colinas, that it was going to be uh, a, a wider path than just a traditional, you know, not much wider, I would say, than, than most of what Blackstone is. Um, we walked it as well back then. Um, and I, I'm in agreement with Bill on this one. Like, I'm not saying I haven't walked it recently. I'm not saying that we should put the path in there, but man, if we're going to like, this guy's going to throw us or this company is going to throw us 35,000. That that's nothing. Right. Because their whole buildable plan there is contingent upon making this path happen. So I, I think that we should be asking them to make this path happen in a way that doesn't end up making the maintenance fall on us. Um, in the sense that this thing has to be so well constructed. Um, I mean, there's, there's too many other communities that have beautiful paths running along their waterways um, that we should be able to maintain with, with a, a minimal amount of maintenance. Um, I mean, does it, does it say anywhere in the conditions that it can't be paved? Uh, they would never let you pave it there. You'd never get away from, with that from an environmental standpoint. Um, soluble surface versus non-soluble uh, it would need to be a dirt path that okay. would be my uh, my experience would tell me that uh, just because it's not along a roadway i mean you're kind of going through that area um boy and i think you'd be quickly uh, looking at a you know million dollar plus uh, oh, project I, at that point no doubt yeah no i totally but, agree which is why thirty five thousand doesn't seem like a whole lot because what i'm yeah. saying is if they're going to if we're going to agree to not build this because it's too much of a hassle for this company, um, then I think we should be getting a lot more money than 35,000 so that we can, you know, I, I don't want to use the term upgrade because that's not what the open space potentially is, but we could certainly be upgrading things within Marin with that, that speak to the open space and recreation style things more than 35,000 bucks. I mean, far more. I'm, I'm thinking possibly maybe the splash pool. Ah. <laughs> um, I, do, I think there's a, there's, if I, I think this company should be all in on something and, and maybe that's just me being naive, but they should be all in on something far more than that. I, I kind of see that 35,000 is a little bit of a slap in the face. Like we're a bunch of people who don't know what this is worth. concur I, I understand the concerns i just am really bummed that there won't be a pathway i feel like it's something that would work with our community and i just am wondering if there's a way like chris said 
to work with them so that they do build something that we can maintain. Um, but I'm not an expert. It's, I, it's wishful thinking and thinking about how our community uses it. And the, probably people are going to walk through it anyways. No? And creating their own path. And is that going to be worse? Uh, well, nobody walks through it now. Uh, trust me. There is not... It's not but there, but, the, oh. but once but once there's homes there, right? And then and no, there's no are, homes there. But yeah, like, this isn't right? where the this isn't where the homes are at. This is uh um or at least not where the homes are being built. This is kind of almost right across the street from the mini park. Okay. Like adjacent to the Cadoni's property right there. Uh, the, you are, right. It, right. Which okay. is a wide path. And took it about 20 feet in. Until you get to the hill. But I, but I agree with Savon in the sense that when they build that other property and those homes are coming, being placed up on the hill, there there's naturally going to be some egress. I mean, even if it's just kids building bike jumps, um, there's going to be something there. Um, I just I, I'm just of the opinion that if we let these guys off on this, we're not the ones responsible to build this trail. We're going to maintain it, so they have to build it to the level that we we then decide that we're able to maintain it. I mean, I sort of see this as being like a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Somebody else gets to build my my awesome new trail. Yeah, I'll make them pay for that. Mm -hmm. Anybody, Anybody else, else want to chime <laughs> in? <laughs> Nope. Mm -hmm. I want more money. How about that? <laughs> Eric, let me let me ask you this, probably in the more reasonable piece here. How, do we have any sense if, if we go with um, your option number one to solicit a preliminary feasibility study, that you're saying is on us. Do we have any idea how much that might cost us? Uh, not at this point, I don't know. The one person who I've made contact right, with, right, you know, right. basically said he wasn't out and he uh, uh, could provide some uh, uh, other references uh, and referrals of people that he uh, has worked with and trusts as professionals. Sure, uh, sure. So I, I said, great, please send him over. And I haven't heard back from him. Right, right. And, and if this trail, again, I'm jumping like way, way, way far ahead. If, if we press these people and this trail is built, wouldn't they be responsible for all of the environmental impact studies and everything like that? Cause they're the ones building it. It would be part of the trail construction. Yeah. I, I guess we're supposed to give you some direction. Uh, I would, I would ask that we would look at a preliminary feasibility study. Let's see if we can't pull something like that up. I, I don't disagree with you, Chris. I personally would like to have something like that. Uh, I would be curious to see what it would say. That's, um, that's my whole thing. I think and have, having somebody who knows what they're looking at much more than us, even though we did have right. somebody out there who's got some pretty good experience. That he'd, he's not a trail designer by any yeah. stretch. He works with trail designers. Right. Um, well, and, and John wondering. helped do a great job on the Ponte. And that's what I'm saying. We, we like, who's to say that we couldn't do, I mean, I realized that was multi-million dollar. Um, but it's not like this guy is saying, hey, look, if you decide now, I'll give you a million dollars if you don't want to build this trail. This guy is basically saying, I'll, I'll, I'll buy your toilet paper for the next year. I mean, this is nothing. <laughs> oh, I have one question. If they're building, wouldn't there, and I know we're not, there's a difference between a fire trail and a fire road, but would they not have to build some kind of fire trail or something so no, there's access? Yeah. Well, they'll have access. Um, access through Marinwood Drive. Yeah, they're they're extending Marinwood Drive. It's going to become a long paved road leading to their facility, kind of at the bottom of the other hillside, parallel to 101. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, it's going to go up uh, on, on the bottom of the hill, just I'm just south of the it. waste, just south of the way station. They're going to wipe out the graveyard. Yep. I see a series of bridges crisscrossing the pristine creek as we watch the salmon spawn once again. Oh, there'll be a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Want to take public comment, Bill? Yeah, go for it. All right. 
One second. I'm going to bring uh, Irv uh, Schwartz over. Irv, can you hear us? Irv, you might need to unmute. Okay. Huh. Uh, board members, I'm Irv Schwartz, longtime resident of the district, past board member and parks and rec commissioner and all sorts of things like that. I've been working on the development of this, what was originally 106 acres since 1981. <laughs> they finally got approvals from the county around 2005. And in order to implement the first segment of that approval, they entered into an agreement with your board to build a trail along Miller Creek from Las Colinas to Wynwood Avenue. Uh, the performance bond, based on the estimated cost of the work, of $29,000. That was the amount of money that was envisioned at the time based on the kind of trail that was envisioned at the time. The, with these entitlements and this agreement, the owners then sold the property to a developer who is looking to build a senior care facility on the property. And so he inherited the condition of building a trail. And his assumption was in the range of $30,000. When we took the walk that Eric mentions, uh, John Campo started looking at things and he was talking the building part, a couple hundred thousand dollars, not to mention the permitting, the environmental review and all of that. When I told the developer that, I said, well, they, he doesn't, the developer does not feel he's obligated to spend that kind of money. He's obligated to spend money in the range of $29,000 plus, I assume, 15 years worth of inflation. I don't know what that comes out. But he said, how about if we offer the district to make a one-time payment in lieu of building this trail? And he said, ask the district if $35,000 would be a uh, good way of, uh, or a good substitution for the trail. So that's a little more context than what you had a few minutes ago, I hope. Thank you. If you have questions of me, I'm here. Thanks, Irv. Thank you, Irv. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank and you, like Irv. Yeah, and Irv, again, yeah. is you know very much connected to this project so uh, he would he definitely has a much deeper insight on it than i can provide so i would take advantage of having irv on the line here if you had questions of him on any of this that kind of brings it back <laughs> wow 29 grand a bond for a simple trail um irv it I'm trying to figure out what I want to ask. Um, the, are, are, are they in fact responsible to build us the trail? I mean, my, you know, the house I live in now, probably, you know, my parents bought it in 76 for 89,000. I think it's going to be a little more expensive than that now. Um, do, don't, I mean, aren't we doing market value here? Maybe there's something I'm missing. Well, that's why I said, uh, and I'm not a, a financial person. Right, I'm not it, either. It would be reasonable to take that $29,000 figure and inflate it to for 15 years. And maybe that's a proper number. Okay. But that's, I think, as much as this developer will spend on a trail. And it's in, in listening to John Campo, it sounds like that may be the cost of the study you're talking about. Right. Not, not even the design, just yeah. the feasibility study. So, so if, if we were to say, nope, we want a trail and we want you to build it, what, then what do you think are, are, is the, I mean, is this guy potentially just going to turn around and say, sorry, I'm not going to build my facility? No, but I think you may get a $35,000 trail. And <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you take, if you walk it like I did with. with yeah, yeah, I've walked it before. Eric, I totally know what you're talking about. You know, I walked it back in, you know, 15, 20 years ago and it was yep. totally different then. I think you and I walked it together, to be honest. 
Yeah, maybe. But it's right up against the eroding bank of the creek. That's the problem. Because the first thing the developer said to me was, can't we just move it away from the creek? And the problem is the hill is just too steep. It but just, John Campos solved that on Ponte. No, it, but this is parallel to the to the right. Slope. No, no, no. I know. Not but if we particular to it, if we took it in a little different direction, I mean, if you went Ponte straight up, which was the issue with Ponte prior to this new trail, it's all the switchbacks. So if you took that, if you did the switchbacks all the way up this hill, potentially we make it into a situation where it is feasible to have uh, a trail that doesn't have to exactly follow the creek. Well, the condition is that it, follow, that, that it be located within the existing grade bench along the creek. Okay. Bed. It be a fly graded. Is that what it trail. says in the, in, the, in the agreement? Pretty much, yes. Interesting. Okay. Thank you, Irv. I really appreciate it. I did a quick calculation. I'm sure that Kathleen can do this too better. But the 29,000, I found a website and in, from 1981 to today's terms, it's $87,528.92. So you, you said from 1981, you have to figure it from 2006. That's oh, it's from 2006? 2015 yeah. years. Oh, so it's even less. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, neither of them is going to pay for anything that would resemble a trail. No, that, so. that's, the, that's the thing that was so disappointing to me because I wanted the trail there also. Uh, hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Anybody? Any more questions? I have no idea. I don't. Thanks for spending the time tonight, Irv. Appreciate it. Uh, welcome. Thanks a lot, Irv. You're welcome. Uh, well, uh, I would like to get some feedback as to kind of what you would like to do because yeah. the is proceeding with this project. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm hesitant. Chris. I think we have to get our other public comment first, though, before we can move forward, right? You are correct, Chris. Let's uh, let me move on to bring in another one. If you can hold on to uh, Bill, do you want me to leave Irv in uh, for context or go ahead and, and move him out? Yeah, I mean, he might as well listen. Okay, one second. <laughs>
Well, <laughs> uh, I don't know where to go from here, Eric, honestly. Well, if I could, uh, you know, I'd go back to what I actually did say, which was, I think, you know, it, your first step is going to be conducting a level of a feasibility study on right. this area. And if, if putting a trail in this area is even feasible, um, is actually what I said. So it's, uh, I, I would probably recommend moving in that general direction. Uh, you know, these, these people aren't just necessarily in the yellow pages. So we're already actively working towards references towards this. Um, and I, I certainly questioned the feasibility and practicality of putting a trail in this area. Somebody who just recently went through there. Um, I'm very clear, not a professional in that world. Uh, we don't have that resource. These are, you know, outside consultants that would need to come in. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't even know that the study initial study that we're looking for is, uh, you know, necessarily something that fully exists. I mean, this would be a customized study strictly for this area for this purpose. Right. Yeah, maybe we could find a herd of deer to blaze a trail. I, I, I think there's some extra elk out there at uh, Point Reyes. Maybe we could get them over here. Yeah, that sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, I like that. I, I think we have to at least look at our options. We got to try. Yeah. I, I, I don't hard. disagree. Are we, do we have to do an official motion here or are we just giving you a no. No, no, you're not Direction. doing anything. We'll just keep moving forward on looking towards a, uh, you know, finding some of these consultants who do this work and getting just some initial proposals on uh, what it would be to move forward that way. And depending on the total cost of what these proposals would be, I could bring that information to you when I get it, or if the cost is not substantial, uh, it's certainly within my authority to just move forward with it. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, Irv, we'll be in touch. Yeah, may I add one thing? You're going to ask then for a feasibility study, including a cost analysis? Yes. Uh, yeah, a cost estimation. I think cost analysis would probably be part more of a larger design, but I certainly want, yeah, some idea around what would be the cost of building such a trail. I'm going to get what I can get from them. That's for sure. You're muted, or if you're trying to say something, we can't hear you. I, I don't know why. I, something going on with my computer. Yes, I, I cost or something that I am certainly going to inquire about. You know, I, I don't know that our uh, what I'm looking for, as opposed to say a full blown trail design. Um, I, I, I want to find out what's possible and what we can do. What we can and uh, cannot do. Well, exactly. Just in terms of some of this initial analysis. All right. That sounds good. I think Irv raised his hand after you were talking. No, I'm just trying to figure out your, your gadget here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it, Irv. It's not worth it. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank th you. Thanks, Irv. Thanks, Irv. Thank you, Irv. And thank you for your historical knowledge. Uh, on to the Recreation and Park Maintenance Activity Report. That would be thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Um, trying to keep this relatively um, to the point uh, as we had a lot of discussion tonight. Um, I just want to touch on a few things on the recreation side. Um, I think since we last uh, since we last met, we saw the end of our um, summer our official summer season uh, with our camp program ending um, on August twelfth after running for nine weeks. Um, we served about 350 campers each day, plus um, some 40 odd uh, counselors in training. Um, and uh, it was it was a challenging summer. Um, I think our, our moment of silence at the beginning of the of the um, meeting was um, uh, played a big, uh, a big role in, in sort of how the summer ended for our, our camp program. But um, uh, instead of being um, ending in, in just a, in a feeling of total tr tragic loss, which, which was definitely part of it, um, we thankfully had a last day of camp that was, um, our staff really came together and um, was united and, and made a real effort to, to end the camp season on a positive note in spite of 
um, a lot of the tragedy and, and sadness that, that our um, whole staff was feeling uh, from just finding out the day before uh, the end of our summer. So um, it was a strange, a really strange season in, in the sense of um, uh, having to go through that. And, and um, but then uh, I'd say I've, I've never seen a staff that was more tightly knit um, at the end of a summer. So um, that was something that was really, it was powerful and, and, and uh, interesting to, to go through. And overall, um, all of that aside, it, it was a really successful summer. Um, we faced a lot of challenges with our um, health restrictions, and we weren't able to do a lot of the things we would do in a traditional summer. Um, but the staff really rallied and brought their, um, their, the highest level of energy and just did everything they could to really make it a, a magical summer for the kids like, like we always try to do. And, um, and it really showed and the kids uh, and the parents were, were so grateful on um, the feedback we got was um, some of the, the more uh, positive and appreciative feedback that, that I've ever um, heard from our, you know, our participants. So that was, that was nice to, to get that at the end of the summer. And, um, and I think I mentioned before, but this was my first uh, summer going through camp is not just um, a staff member and director, but I'm also a dad. My, my six-year-old was, was in camp acorn most of the summer. And, um, it was really, it was really, uh, just a great experience to, to, to get to see our program from that perspective. And, um, it made me very, uh, grateful to the staff and, and to Robin for, um, just all of the hard work and creativity, uh, that she has put in that program. So, um, that was, that was really special for, for me, but, um, uh, the pool season continues on, um, and we've pivoted to our fall season and, uh, it's been great. We've had so many phone calls uh, with this hot weather, people being like, are you open? Do I need a reservation? Oh, I can't believe you're open. I can't believe I can just show up to your pool. I don't need to call in advance. I don't need to do anything special. And, um, our ability to be able to pivot at the pool, to be able to offer a normal programming and drop in recreation hours and drop in lap swim hours has really set us apart from almost all of the pools in the area. And, uh, we've had just cust you know, new, new patrons from all over the place. Just so grateful to have a pool they can hop in when it's, you know, 85, 90 degrees out. And uh, I've just been very, very pleased with it. The staff was able to, um, with John Paul and, and Robin and the part-time and the lifeguards were able to, to pivot and add in these hours, change our situation from, from being all reservations, all restricted to, to be able to do something very, very normal and to just accommodate, um, the summer pool demand in a way that a lot of places for whatever reason haven't been able to do. So I'm very proud of the, of the staff and it's been, um, it's been a great season. We've had swim lessons going um, that are filling up. We've had um, just a, a huge crowd every day um, and it's been, it's been great. So fall season goes for an, about another month, a little less than a month. And, um, and we're, we're just plowing through and that's, that's been a really, really good season. Um, and then we've, we've started a lot of our fall programs this last couple of weeks with the start of the preschool, the after school, school program, and then a, a whole slew of, of other recreation classes for adults and kids. Um, we're actually offering a very similar amount of programs to a normal season in spite of the fact that uh, we have some instructors that are wary of, of um, running classes indoors right now with, with uh, COVID-19 still being a big factor and they've been able to move outdoors. We've had um, to just be uh, limited in some ways, but um, we have a very, very uh, normal, traditional fall uh, program going on right now. I'm very pleased with that. We're able to all together to all of our instructors who are going to come back and and get all those programs jump started that were on hold for a lot of the the past year. So that's been really fun to kind of get back to normal. The community center is um, well, not 100% back to what we would have, you know, a couple of years ago. It's it's very bustling, and, and we've got um, a lot of things going on all the time. We did put out a, a Marin, the Marinwood Review, our big catalog of, of classes. We, we committed to doing it in print. It went out um, uh, in the mail to thousands of homes, and we've seen a lot of signups from that. And um, that is another thing that I'm really proud of with our department is that we, um, we don't have a graphics design department. We don't have a firm we contract with. We don't have anyone on staff that's dedicated to doing that. A lot of other bigger cities and bigger departments do have staff that just sit there and, and create uh, marketing materials and, and do graphic design. And there's only a, a few of us uh, in the recreation department. And um, Carolyn, our uh, senior administrator, she basically does the, the whole catalog um, herself from scratch. And in, in addition to all the other responsibilities, and it looks fantastic. It's on par with some of the best um, ones out there. And 
Um, and so I'm just very, very uh, proud to, to be able to have something like that in-house without spending a bunch of money on it. And we're able to do that um, and be nimble. And we're one of the only people that committed to, to getting it out there. So the programs are running great and, um, and we're really excited for what we have to offer this fall. Um, and we do have just a couple events we're planning right now and hopefully we'll be able to add more. It's kind of tricky right now to, to plan for, for public gatherings amidst the, um, the, the health situation. So we are treading carefully and, um, and we're in touch with the, with the health department, with a lot of other agencies to figure out what makes the most sense and what's the safest route to take for, um, for offering uh, event programming for our community. But right now we do have um, uh, an art show scheduled for November. We are planning a, um, some revised version of, the, of, of a Halloween event that we'll be announcing very shortly. Um, it definitely won't be a giant uh, open house um, in, indoors, but um, we, we will have something that, that will be a lot of fun and, and staff's working hard to come up with something that makes sense that um that is that that's a safe move for everyone so we'll be we'll be announcing all the deals of that in the coming in the coming weeks um so yeah that's on the on the rec side uh, moving to the parks maintenance side of things um i heard something about a, a new phantom manager and i'm i'm really excited to find out who that is that would be amazing uh uh for our parks department but we do um we have three staff uh, on the park staff we did hire a new a uh, temporary employee um, a few weeks ago. His name is Jonathan. Hopefully, you guys will get to meet him. And uh, and he's been it's been great to have our our department made whole again. Uh, and he's learning the ropes right now. And Estevan and Marco are working very hard to get him up to speed and train him on all the things um, that they that we need him to know. But um, uh, our staff used to be much bigger. We used to have uh, five six people with a dedicated. Um, parks maintenance director so things are definitely scaled down um in the last uh, handful of years um but these guys estevan marco um have just really rallied to keep um our parks maintained keep our facilities up the facility is getting older but um, these guys work really really hard to, to keep everything looking the way it does um just a regular day-to-day -day and weekly tasks are, are a big job for a staff of three one of whom's brand new um, in addition to all of their, their regular tasks, which I do list every one of my reports, just sort of like, this is what they do, um, you know, throughout the days and weeks. But in addition to that, this last month, um, these guys were seen uh, rebuilding open space fences um, out on Kernberry. They were cutting up trees that had fallen um, on the path. And uh, thanks to Stephen, um, he did point one of those out to me over the weekend, a couple weeks ago for us to, to find that. Um, these guys replaced some sump pumps in the, in the pump room pit They're You've seen the fencing out at the park. They're rehabilitating the turf, um, seeding, soiling, uh, doing, um, aeration, uh, fixing irrigation. And, uh, they built, uh, extended the retaining wall at the parks maintenance facility. And, um, and then a big project that, that involved, um, a lot of the last couple of weeks was we are replacing a, uh, or upgrading a water pipe in the park that is undersized for our needs. Um, that involved renting a big excavator, digging a big trench. Uh, they're out there soldering pipes, running um, all new pipe along the length of the park. And that's been a big project. Uh, they did a great job. And um, so these guys have a lot on our plate and I am extremely amazed at what they're able to get done. Um, so just want to kind of appreciate Marco and Estevan and, and our new guy, Jonathan, for um, everything they've done this past month. It's been a really busy month and uh, it's been kind of a whirlwind, but they've been uh, doing doing great with that. So um, that's what I wanted to cover mainly. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions though. That's a lot of work, thank you. I have one question and I just, um, and I know this is, the wrong place to look, but on next door, there was a few comments about the sprinklers going off during the day. And um, I'm, it's, it's sad to see how instantly everyone just goes so negative as if we're not following guidelines. And I understand that that's just human nature and that's how the world works right now. But is there any way, like I'm assuming that we do follow the regulations and we are using recycled water is there a way to like just put out signs or whatever while we're doing all this work through a drought so it kind of 
quiets the talkers. Yeah, we, we have some signs up. Oh yeah, we definitely could put some more up, especially in the areas that were watering, you know, during the middle of the day and, and uh, that would maybe raise red flags for, for people concerned about the drought. Um, we could definitely put some out, especially in the areas that are fenced off or they're getting a lot more water right now. I think that's, that's probably a really, a really good idea. Um, but yeah, we can I just want to keep their complaints. I don't want them going to the water department and Eric's getting reports. You know what I mean? I'm trying to head this off before too much work needs to happen. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely, we can definitely uh, increase some of the uh, communication out there. Okay. Thank you. <sighs> Anybody else? I, I just have a quick one and I, I think I've had this answered before, but like a million years ago on my extensive commute to Miller Creek middle school, when I cross over the green bridge, I know it, it isn't that who, like apart from the tennis courts, which I know we maintain, is it the job of the school district to maintain the vegetation over there? Which uh, part specifically are I'm you? Just, I'm thinking like, as I snake over the bridge and cut by the tennis courts, um, I can't remember if it's if it's the school district guys that take care of the vegetation, like right by the tennis courts. It's just it it tends to grow up a little bit. And right now the the um, that trail is, I would say, like two thirds blocked. But I think it's usually the the school district guys that do that. Right. Yeah, they, they hit that up. I mean, there's times when, you know, we'll go out there and, and do some of the things like if it's directly stuff's growing into the courts, we'll we'll take care of that to keep right. the courts clear. Uh, stuff that's, you know, if trees are grown over the path or things, um, you know, it, it gets a little, yeah, the property line is, is um, okay. kind of crisscrosses there. But uh, yeah, typically the, the school's out there um, maintaining right. that to some degree, but we, we okay. do get some I'll, of that. I, I well. see those guys all the time. I'll chat with them. I just couldn't remember. It popped into my head right now. Thank you very much, Luke. You, you and your staff do an amazing job. Thanks, Chris. Who bulldozed the, the uh, bike jump there? Was that the school? The that one. Was, oh, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm. I was just clarifying which one you're referring to, Bill. The one uh, on that the side. The one of the about. Let's see. When I'm trying to remember when my son was. So at least ten years ago. It was when was they big, when they put the the new right path by, in. They replaced the path. Yeah, they when they the had dirt. the. Uh, it was right where the tennis courts were. I think technically old, that was third party, wasn't it? Because it was big old mound. I'm trying to think, it was Cal Harris that did it. Was it? He's the one who organized the project. So I think that was more like school districty third party. Okay. It's not the same people that filled the hole in the firemen's barbecue area when that used to have a dip there too. <laughs> We're taking away all Sorry, the bike. Did, wait, no more bike wait did I just age myself? I was saying um, that I know that uh, the the parks maintenance staff has over the years done uh, a lot of um, you know it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game by going out and and uh, knocking down you know rogue um, jumps and and stuff that gets built um, out out there. But I I'd say I'm sure there's been other parties that have that have dealt with that as well. Okay, I'm just curious as to which. <clears throat> cool. Any other? No, just thank you for all you guys do. Anything from the public?
Thank you, Stephen. Is there anybody else, Eric? I guess. No, no sir. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Uh, the date of the next Park and Recreation Commission meeting is September 21st. Okay, on to board member items of interest, request for future agenda items. Everyone, if I may. Go, Lise. <laughs> um, thank you. So it, this is kind of the second, um, I don't know, point or uh, just, just item that I wanted to bring up when we were discussing the fires earlier. Um, the, and I, don't, and I don't know if this is the right forum, so please, kibosh me, redirect me if, if this isn't the place. Um, however, the, 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 the cell phone reception in um, many parts of Lucas Valley, um, specifically um, as you get further west to upper Lucas Valley, is um, it's, it's always been kind of a nuisance. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've lived here for you know, close to 10 years at this point, it's always been this way. And again, a nuisance, but when, when, when situations come up, like these types of emergencies, um, you know, power engine were also an issue as well. Um, when something like a, like a fire comes about and, you know, we realize that there's just not the, it, it, we can't, we can't get in touch with each other and people can't be, um, share the information about something. So, um, dangerous um, where an action is needed. Um, I, I just I just wonder if there's any way that we can start the discussion um, ab about um, how we can change that and if we can change that and um, get cell service to a place where it's safe in our mm. community. Yeah. <laughs> I don't personally know that the district itself would have any pool nor authority in this, but I can certainly bring it up to uh, the Marin County OES office. I mean, we've done this before in the past. I kind of appreciated hearing uh, Chief Windrum talk earlier saying, hey, we were out there in the middle of this incident and we were having problems with, you know, what is some basic communication because this is kind of a dead zone. I I think there's like one carrier who has a tower in that area. And I think it's like Sprint uh, in, you know, the old, I think they're the ones that work. Mm -hmm. um, I know that if I'm, you know, out front of the community center and pointed south by southwest with my other arm pointed in the opposite direction, I can sometimes get a signal. Um, I'll definitely speak to, uh, uh, to the chief, uh, and as well as, you know, kind of bringing this back up to the OES. At the end of the day, cellular carriers are private companies, so I don't know what kind of obligation they have to fill these little pockets, uh, but we can try to follow up with them and see. They would have some pool more than us, especially from an emergency uh, response standpoint. Um, but I, that would be my avenue, and I'm happy to pursue that a little bit uh, again in CFA. Now that we've had an incident, now that we've had first responders who, you know, lack basic cell phone use uh, in trying to communicate, you know, how do we kind of go about this? Is there some more pressure that could be put? I don't know the answers to it, Lisa, but the the uh, the Office of Emergency Services for Marin County certainly would know more than I would about it. Well, I know about ten years ago they issue came up about building a cell tower here and <laughs> no one wants it. it it raised all kinds of ire from the community but nobody wants it until yeah. they need it until they right. need I, 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 I wonder if the perspective would be different as of right. now than it was back then maybe uh, but that was such a long time ago uh, I, I remember when we first moved in here and we had AT&T and the kids were swimming at the pool and you couldn't, there was zero, nothing. You had to walk out to the parking lot to get a bar. And that's why we switched 
to sprint finally because yeah well and i know with mira the marine emergency radio authority this is a large reason part of the reason why they're also upgrading (laughs) at some point in time to uh this you know next gen which by the time it's done will probably be old gen wasn't that five years ago (laughs) that's still yeah and the white uh, boxes that we got that but one of the primary (laughs) towers is actually going to be on big rock ridge so it might be an opportunity uh there to uh, you know, just in terms of adding, uh, you know, cellular to it as well. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, these are all avenues that could be pursued. And Mira actually might be a, a decent venue by which to bring that up, considering the players that are involved in Mira consists of a lot of, uh, you know, emergency services people and things like that. I mean, I, I think that's your best angle of getting traction. I, I don't, I, you know, unfortunately, it's just such a small population. I don't know that, uh, you know, in terms of like AT&T or Verizon looking at it, they're like, you know, what's my ROI on this? I get a handful of extra subscribers. But uh, I think the only your best bet avenue is looking at this from an emergency uh, access response uh, and accessibility standpoint. So I'm, I'm happy to bring that up. Uh, I'm happy to reach out to the OES department, too. I have relationships with them and just ask, hey, is there anything here that can be done on this level? What about also Thank maybe you. looping in uh, Damon on that and just trying to get him behind that as well? Damon sure. Yeah. I mean, that might be a decent place to start from the beginning, too, and just say, Damon, look into this for us. You have constituents who can't call each other during a wildfire. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good suggestion. I don't. Chris. I mean, I don't. I don't know if it's a if it's a if it's a carrier issue or if it's a, a structure issue that we do or don't want to have constructed in our neighborhoods. I think that's kind of a piece of it too. Really knowing why why we don't have the coverage. Right. Yeah, I don't I think know why. I think it's both. Yeah, I don't. I I know that people have Sprint uh, and their affiliates. Their phones work. Yeah. And I know people who have AT and T and Verizon. Their phones don't. My so, pro- I have Verizon and my phone works just fine. Yeah, but if you go AT and D, if not. you go up the block a couple blocks but, with it. Yeah, if you come to my house, Devon, it's not going to work unless you yeah. go into our well router. It, and twenty years ago, AT and T didn't even work in Marin County. I mean, in Marin Wood. So, no. like rule of thumb, if you got my voicemail right away, call the house phone because my cell phone wasn't working. So that's just well, let me let me follow up and see if we can get some traction. I think uh, Damon Connolly is a good first step there too, and I'll definitely let him know that this came up at a board meeting in response to this thing. And what does he know, and uh, how can he help? He may put it into the planning commission. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know what the barriers are. I, you know, everything I say is just conjecture uh, yeah. and not not educated. So okay. Um, and then can thank I just have, thank you. Can I just add one more thing? Are we adding the, the radios that we have? Are we adding that to the fire commission? Uh, yeah, I'm sure Topic, that uh, I'll, talk to, I'll talk to, to the emergency. Steve Barak, who's the chair on that. Um, okay. You know, and at the end of the day, that's not our program. That's through fire safe. So I imagine he'll want to talk about it, but, uh, We'll certainly uh, reach out to FireSafe, who I don't know that they're the ones who kind of lead the, the it's not a grant program per se, but led that uh, pilot study. Um, mm-hmm. So, and I think they did that a little bit in coordination with the sheriff's office and OES as well. So let me, uh, you know, kind of reach out to them and just say, hey, you know, what kind of information can I get? We're getting some questions from the people who are part of our study here. Well, had we have had a fire commission, it would have been probably <laughs> added to that agenda, but that's okay. So thank you. Anybody else? Uh, public. Oh, wait, sorry. It was taking me a second to unmute. Just an update on whatever happens with trying to get uh, study for the trail that we had talked about and um, yeah i'll give you an update on that and then just to reflect the public's comments if chief white can have uh written up 
report about the Mount Lassen fire, that would be great. Yeah, he's intending on including that okay. uh, for sure. And he usually tries to cover the month prior uh, and that did happen to happen in that month, but he's certainly, I think, looking to have some sort of a summary uh, written report in it as well. I expect him back hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Okay, just wanted to make sure since the public requested. Yep, no problem. One second. Uh, anything else? Great. Okay. One second, Bill. All right. Thanks, Stephen. <clears throat> uh, that concludes, and I'm on to I, which would be entertaining a motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. I'll second. All those in favor? Oh, welcome back, Tiffany. Yes. <laughs> I've been here the whole time. Sorry, I, to, I wake, know. sorry to wake you up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Board President Shea. Uh, aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Ruggieri. Aye. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good, night. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Thank all. You. Thank you all. Good night, you guys. Good night. Mm.